All right, welcome back everybody to part two of our uh, previously uh, looking at the uh, current virus pandemic that we've got going on. And uh, we've got our special uh, guest star, Megan, who uh, is our resident expert on anything uh, biological. Um, so uh, we talked uh, previously about uh, what a virus is, transmission, risk, risk, risk factors. We also looked at uh, a little bit of immunology and as well, we kind of dived into some data literacy and um, effect of the media on all this. Um, so for our second part, um, where did where did you want to start, Megan? So um, I was going to start with talking a little bit about the vaccines and what they are, how they work, because um, we have some new types of vaccines here that don't work the way that that are a little bit different than what the traditional ones we have are. So um, that was kind of the plan to talk about those. And then we'll go from there. So we'll start with wanna, the MR. Sorry, ahead, you want to start maybe with the the traditional vaccines and then we'll say how these ones are different maybe. Injecting so that out. way it'll give people a baseline of what we mm. normally do versus what we're actively doing. Okay, that sounds good. So there's generally you have live and inactive or not live vaccines. Um, so your live vaccines are when you have like a crappy version of the virus. So you have a virus that sucks a whole lot, but still looks like the actual virus. Um, and then this gets injected into your muscle. These ones are always intramuscular, which is like right in your arm, the way that most vaccine people think of vaccines being. And they actually do replicate in your cells, but they don't cause damage. So you might get like a few symptoms, but um, th these ones are generally more effective and last longer because they behave more like viruses. And this includes your MMR is the most common live virus vaccine. What does uh, MMR stand for? It's the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Now it also has uh, vermicella, which is chickenpox often, but it depends, Ooh. regional differences for that one. I love vermicelli. <laughs> good good cool. for you. Um, yeah, the, uh, so that's your, your live vaccine. So um, also included in this might be like smallpox, which was based on cowpox was live at some point. Um, there's the original polio vaccines were also live, but those were found to cause some nasty side effects and infections. So they were no longer used. Now we only have inactivated. So what inactivated is, is it means that there isn't a virus that can replicate. It's just either a piece of the virus or just a dead virus that gets injected into you. So the thing with this one is because it's not actually replicating in your body. Your, your immune system might not really notice that it's there. So these ones have to include what's called adjuvants. And adjuvants are something that just make your immune system see, like kind of turn on and activate. So then it, once it's activated, then it will see the inactivated particles, which again are either like chunks of dead virus or maybe just a specific protein from the virus. Or there's some like the uh, pneumonococcal ones or like actually just pieces of the sugar depending there's two different types, but not important. Um, so they, they include like an extra adjuvant, which is often aluminum, but it's not always. Um, and it's such a small amount and you get it like once that it's not gonna like give you aluminum poisoning. So, um, and those are your like traditional viruses. So they're either a live version of the virus that can replicate, but it like sucks a lot. It doesn't have any of the infectivity. So it'll just replicate like once or twice and then die off. Um, and then your immune system will mop it up and then it'll learn what the, what the bad cells look like, like we found before. So it'll find it in the index and then activate that part of the index. So then now if you run into it in real life, you'll see that it's bad and then you'll start fighting it right away instead of having that like long delay before your body starts fighting it. Kind of like showing someone a car by having a hot or wheels. Kind thing. Of, like this is what it looks like. Like if you, you have like a someone escapes the prison yard and you show everyone their picture now everyone knows to look for that person so mm. they if they do see them they can be like hey that guy's not a good guy instead of waiting for him to like rob a bunch of stores and then you then you go and find that he's not good um how do we know it's him because he's robbing a store <laughs> anyway that was that might not be the best analogy but that's what i came up with um so the 
and those are like the original so inactivated is basically everything but it's pretty much everything else is an inactivated vaccine so like your flu shots inactivated every year like polios are now all inactivated whatever like most of those and um so oh, yeah, then, then you also have vaccines that are toxoid vaccines is what they're called. They kind of fall under inactivated as well, but they are actually, they give you a piece of a, a toxin that causes an issue. So that's your like tetanus diphtheria te um, pertussis vaccine, the one that you're supposed to get every 10 years. That's a toxoid vaccine. So that's, um, that's why you have to get it every 10 years as well. So that one's just, they take a piece of the thing that's toxic that causes your body to, that causes you to get sick. And then they stick it on another protein and then you um, make an immune response to that. And then that's how those ones work. So these, the new vaccines, both the mRNA and the viral vectors are a little bit different. So they have been studied before in the past in trials, but they aren't any like on the market for mRNA vaccines. Um, we'll start with those. So that's your Pfizer and Moderna. There are other groups in development right now, but those are the ones that are on the market. So those are the ones I'll talk about. Um, so the way that these work is, so we, they have a piece of mRNA. So what that is, it's messenger RNA, and it contains instructions for how to make the spike protein. So the spike protein is the thing on the outside of your coronavirus, like the actual virus that your body recognizes as being foreign and goes, that's a bad guy. So what you're giving them is you're giving them the blueprints to make a spike protein. So then you hand the blueprints over and all the other parts of the vaccine, like they're in a nanoparticle, that's just to get it into your cell. The important parts of the vex, the, the RNA. And, and that spike is kind of like a, an injection of like a syringe or something like that, right? It's, it's an like, inter intramuscular injection the same way as most of the, most vaccines know, The are. spike on the protein at the end of the, the, the coronavirus? Yeah. The part that you're, you're fitting for? Mm -hmm. I think. This is sort of supposed to be a question. Is that the way that the, the it, like a harpoon that goes into the cells that it's infecting? It's or? more that it's what binds to that. It's what you're, what it binds to on your cells to allow it to enter the cell. So it actually binds to angioconverting enzyme two, which isn't really important. So is it like but it gets stuck like in. a hook or is it something that like grabs on and injects well, itself? The like it binds to the outside of your cell. And then once it's bound, then your cell's like, oh, friend. So it just takes it in. Oh, so it absorbs it. It's not like forcing its way in or anything no, like that? No, it's it's just once it binds, then then it gets absorbed essentially. I got this Jerry Bruckheimer idea is, of like a Tom Clancy version of virology. Are we trying to make virology <laughs> about rape? I don't know what's happening. No, I'm but trying to make okay. it easier to comprehend like yeah. a SWAT team breaking into a building, but it's yeah. not like that. It's, it's more like standing at the door long enough that somebody lets you in. A little bit, yeah. Because like your cells aren't smart enough to have SWAT teams. They're just they're just hanging out doing their yeah. thing and then if something shows up and binds it's like oh hey friend so it's like a so, passive aggressive infiltration kind something of. like that yeah yeah but a bad friend it's not a good friend some like manipulative it, like, stop eating my chips <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah wipe this sorry the visual helps <laughs> yeah okay so yeah it, it, where was i yeah so basically You're talking you about have, the binding oh, yeah sorry. so you have a particle which is just it's like nanoparticle which is just a really small particle it makes it sound cool and sci-fi but it's not it's just a little ball like we talked about it earlier with like the balls of the lipid bilayers so they're like what like water yeah, on the go, middle and yeah that go over the d20 yeah they go over <laughs> the d20 um but this time there isn't a d20 in there it's just some mrna so it's just All some right. free floating RNA. So once it goes, once it goes into the cell, then the RNA, so they, the RNA is like designed to look like our own RNA so that our body, like the, the mechanisms to create protein in our body aren't smart enough to differentiate. Like it, you, you can like manipulate them to make what you want them to make. That's what viruses do generally. So they see this and then they just make the protein. And then what happens is your body produces a whole whack of spike protein. And then like releases it outside of the cell that's part of like the instructions for the protein is to like once you make this protein just release it outside of the cell so it does that now once it's outside of the cell you have those adjuvants present that i mentioned earlier as well so they're making sure that your immune system's turned on and once your immune system's turned on then it will 
find those spike particles and be like, oh, that's a bad guy. So then the whole process of like recognizing it and getting the B cells to turn on and like make your antibodies, then you make your antibodies. So then if you run into a real coronavirus in the wild a month later, then your body will recognize right away that it's a bad guy and will attack it. And then you won't get as sick. Yes. I just had a neat idea I never really thought of before, but correct me if this is wrong. Is that like to mean to say every single cell that can distinguish uh, a good cell from an invasive cell or a protein, I mean, <laughs> like in order for it to communicate, they all have to physically have that block of code to recognize it? So there's like an unbelievably interesting and technical process that occurs like when you're an embryo and a baby, like before you're born, where you have all these, th th there's a, um, like this ridiculous genetic shuffling where like the, the parts of the sequence that like look for specific antigens, like gets shuffled randomly in your DNA. And then you have this fetting process where they're all produced. And then if they bind to other cells, they get destroyed. And this happens before you're born. So that by the time you're born and you're existing, you aren't attacking your own cells. In theory, um, autoimmunity still does happen, but so that you do recognize other cells. So yeah, there's just a bunch of cells that are just hanging out, waiting. And they are usually in your lymph nodes, but sometimes they're floating around, but usually they're kind of... So that means all information at this scale is passed by like acids and proteins and stuff. Like information isn't... Like at this scale, the only thing it can know and differentiate one thing from another is a physical block that it carries around with it? Yeah, it's like, does this bind to this yes or no? And then if it does, then there's a signal pathway that goes on. <laughs> to and essentially call other guys carrying, over yeah and it can't know that without carrying the protein along with it yeah it's just like what before a b cell's ever seen like it's it's specific right. philosophically no that it's so like deep. soulmate it's like <laughs> looking for its soulmate except its soulmate's evil and it wants to kill it so i don't know um, i think i've met this person <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway so you're anti-soulmate no, sorry just the um, idea that information is a physical thing that's transported from one thing to another that just blows my mind there is at that time at that scale there's no like intelligence anymore yeah. it's just things bumping into each other and then doing other things like it's really quite interesting yeah, you have like all these dynamic, complex it's just systems, dynamic things yeah. falling into each other kind of thing it's like falling mm -hmm. down the stairs with a handful of dishes like it just does what it does yeah it's it's neat that is neat sorry and, it just yeah me oh up. good yeah so the the once those b cells are active then and that's why you get when you get a vaccine you get like your immune response happening so you have pain in your arm which is literally just inflammation and like you might damage the muscle a little bit by putting a bunch of liquid into it, but it's mostly like just inflammation. And um, the adjuvants that they put in there are like pretty good, which is why the COVID might be a little bit more than some other vaccines, but it they want it needs to work. So, and then that also explains why like some people get like what we like the systemic symptoms, but that's that's like your fevers and you're just like general blah feeling, um, and. Like, that's why you get those because you, you're that like if you do get feel sick after a vaccine, it's because your immune system's working and it recognized that there's a problem and it's getting a response. So that's sometimes actually seen as good if you actually have some symptoms after getting a vaccine. And that's also why the second shot is usually worse, because once it's seen it once, now it's prepared to see it again. So the second response is usually stronger than the first because it's already looking for that guy. And then the third response is even stronger. It doesn't like keep getting stronger with every response, but there's diminishing returns. But it definitely, there's definitely like a big difference between the first response and the second. And the second and the third are pretty decent. So that's why they have two shots as well as to just get it to that point where you're going to actually respond well enough to prevent you from getting sick enough to need to go to the hospital. And I, I heard that... Um, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but I heard that there's a, the second dose may not even need to be a full dose, like only a half dose maybe would be sufficient. They're playing with that. Yeah, but it's just evidence is kind of. Eh. Is that common in vaccines where you don't actually need a full booster, the second booster versus the first, or are they usually the same? 
or I think it's usually the same. That could like, that's 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 definitely part of it. It's usually a booster dose is just the same thing. Like sometimes you have different amount of antigen in it for like kids and adults and uh, so there's like a different type of flu shot that has more antigen which is for older adults because sometimes they don't have the same like amount of immune response um just because when you get older your immune system isn't as strong as it used to be age <laughs> yeah sorry jordan said something there and then uh i couldn't hear jordan's having a snack <laughs> Snack. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm always. I know. Um, the uh, just another to go back to the vaccines. They also have the viral vectors. It's your like AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson as well. So really, the main difference with that is instead of putting it inside just a nanoparticle, just the like lipid ball, it's actually inside a different virus. They actually use a chimpanzee adenovirus. So adenovirus is just a completely different species brand of virus that causes the common cold sometimes, but they are using a chimpanzee version of it. It can't make you sick because it's, they inactivate it and they take out all the bad stuff that would make you sick. Um, Do they use a chimpanzee specifically because they're close to humans? It's close like- enough, but also not too close that it'll like make you sick. And the other thing with adenoviruses is that they do cause like I think it's less than 10% of common colds, but they do cause common colds sometimes. So some people have seen it before and they have antibodies against the adenovirus itself, which might interfere with how well the vaccine's working. Um, I haven't seen any signals that that's actually an issue. With this one, they are using a different like species of adenovirus than what we would have seen in humans. So that might be part of it. I'm speculating. Well, how long have, when did we start vaccinating people? Because we don't really know the any thing, of the, the long term. Vaccine started already that. over a year ago, and that that was in the oh. Pfizer and Moderna trials. They started like in March of last year. Yeah, because you can. Um, no, I mean, when did the? Because <clears throat> those are the trial rollouts. Mm-hmm. When did the actual like? I, I don't actually remember when they started. It was like December, I want to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So people started getting like of the general populace started getting vaccinated. Uh, in yep. December. So we don't like, that's only actually a couple months. It just seems like longer. Um, mm-hmm. So what? <laughs> Another point that I'll make with vaccines is because vaccines get cleared from your body within like a week or two, long-term effects from vaccines doesn't, don't really happen because it's gone from your body. Like once, once you it's in your arm and then it gets cleared. So like, that's one of the, the good things about vaccines is that they're not going to like give you cancer 30 years down the road because they don't stay in your body. You have an immune response and then you clear it. So it's that kind of, and that's not, that's also a thing that's not being communicated at all. I didn't know that until I learned it in school, like a couple months ago, but it's supposed to, yeah, well, I'm glad I did learn it there and not found out after giving people vaccines for a year. Um, but it's like long-term effects of vaccine don't really happen. Like even the most, the more severe you're like Guillain-Barre, which happens very like one in a million with a flu shot. Um, it's, uh, it's still, it'll show up within a couple of weeks. Like you just like long, long, like months and years down the road from vaccines, you clear it, you get rid of it. So, I mean, I'm not saying it'll never happen and it's a complete impossibility because then someone will find this video 50 years from now and I'll be like, huh, what an idiot. But, um, cause I'm we don't know, that's but the it's case either way. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that means we, we've gotten we better. A, if we get advanced enough in 50 years to, uh, make this look like juvenile trash, that's generally a good thing for humanity. <laughs> so well, it seems the biggest risk to me to an mRNA vaccine would be to permanently change your DNA from a momentary injection. The thing so is, I don't is think the vaccine itself would have to stay in your body to cause cancer. It could just cause cancer 30 years. The thing later. is, is that mRNA is not stable at all. Because if no, your the body changes sees, it makes is directly to you. It doesn't DNA, make right? change. No, it doesn't affect. It oh, doesn't even touch your effects. nucleus. It can't go inside your nucleus. But when it spreads... Won't it those cells spread. It goes. Be, it goes into cells, and then the cell's protein machinery, which isn't associated with the nucleus, make it into a protein. And then as soon as the mRNA gets translated, it immediately gets degraded and it's gone. 
but then the the RNA that your body creates would still be there and it would be an exact copy, would it not? Your body doesn't replicate it. It can't. Well, I thought that's the problem of a virus spreading is that it's replicating itself inside of your own cells. But the the well no, well, the, no the the mRNA right? from the vaccines is literally just a spike protein. It doesn't have the machinery to make a virus. It doesn't make a virus. It just makes a piece of the virus. And it can't self-assemble to make a big viral particle. It's just like one chunk. So so if somebody gets the vaccine, then how come they can't spread just that um, that spike protein? Like, why wouldn't that little a, bit be reproduced with the rest of you? Because it doesn't get reproduced. It, they make it. So when you get a, you get the mRNA and it gets inside your cell, then you have which your ribosome unit, which is your protein making unit, binds to it. And you'll have like a bunch of ribosomes that all bind to it at once. And then they translate it and they make it like a maybe they all go through once and then immediately that thing gets degraded. So now the mRNA is gone forever. And now you have a bunch of spike proteins that are just hanging out. They get sent outside of your cell. Once they either cause an, they either cause an immune response or they just get degraded and they're gone forever. So nothing, those never get duplicated. Even when like the cell splits in half and divides, it doesn't take any of those spike proteins and stuff with it. Well, I mean, they'll still be inside of it, but like your body, like is all, you have things floating around in your cells all the time that are just constantly eating stuff. Hmm. Cause like, and I get that. Yeah, no, so there's I like bet you tons that's most of people's trash misconceptions figures. with these mRNA vaccines. Is yeah. They're thinking like I did that, you know, the, the protein was going directly into the cell reproduct or the DNA reproducing systems of no, your cells. No, it's just the second half of it. It doesn't because you're skip because like when you, so the you machine have, is outside of the factory, right? Yeah, the essentially builds all the stuff what happened, you have your blueprints stored in a facility with walls mm-hmm. and then you have a guy in a truck drive out to the factory and then say make this and then they make it so but then what the mrna vaccine is is it's another guy in a truck drives up to the facility and says make this he's got nothing to do with the big walled in blueprint drawing facility because that step's already been done we've already taken care of that we already drew up the blueprint so like the big facility doesn't get touched at all we just go straight to the factory and the factory guys just do their job and then but the, the factory cell part, not to say anything about people that work in factories, but just saying that like the protein machinery just makes what it sees. It just sees something and then says, oh, and then it makes it. And then that's it. And so then they're it like segregated. Dies. They don't cross into each other's yep. domain kind of thing. Yes. I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions about mRNA viruses is that process right there of like mm-hmm. having separate departments that don't cross over. Yeah, it is. A lot of people hear one thing like RNA, DNA is built from RNA, and they just equate them like I did that one process builds both, but it's not the case. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, I think, I think they actually start teaching that in high school, but it's not like you don't have to take it and it wasn't taught. It's new. Kids are going to high school right now. And people forget (laughs) it because it's just not important to everyday life until there's a pandemic with mRNA viruses. So, and it's really hard once you know something to understand what it's like to not know that thing. That's just a part of human oh. biology, I guess. Yeah, I think that's why podcasts always need at least two people. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't think I'd listen to someone talk to himself for <laughs> that long. <laughs> you don't know what the public doesn't know. You need like a second person to sort of bounce <clears throat> off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the... The mRNA making, like the DNA is like holed up doing its own thing. It can't leave the nucleus. It stays there. The only time it does that is when your cell's dividing because like it has to replicate and divide into two and then it immediately is in two nuclei again. So it's, yeah, there's definitely, they're separate. And like, it is something that was not, not really explained that well, unless you looked for it. Yeah, And you they- like knew what to look for. Yeah, because they kind of were just saying the vaccines out, take it, or you're an evil jerk. And it's like, first of all, it's like I'd love to, but um, thirty-five, self-employed, <laughs> not in yeah. the healthcare sector. Oh, and like, and I sometimes get a sense of what people know because, like, my family will call me and ask me, like, "What's up with this new vaccine? I heard something about it." And yeah. So then I kind of get a sense of what 
people know, but it's, it's hard when I'm like studying all the time to know what's going on around me sometimes. But yeah, so sorry I interrupted you and sidetracked no you there. It was just mm-hmm. no, no, yeah. it's really tripping me up every time I hear that. Like there are a bunch of like nice animations and explanations online, but mm-hmm. it sounds like this is one of those things, kind of like um, code, where you, you the more you hear it in different ways, the better you understand it. And the other thing too is that the vaccine is horribly politicized, and it actually affects the science. Like I'm just trying to get people to understand how it works scientifically. Like I don't really care what you're voting. I want you to know how it works and understand that. But then you get sources that are like, here's how the vaccine works. If you don't get it, you're a racist. And you're like, how does that even make sense? And then you get other ones that are like, vaccines are actually evil. Look how the mRNA is going to change your DNA. And they just like, there's all this like politicized science, but like science is by its notion, a political, at least it should be. It's a method. (laughs) <laughs> well, by definition, I yeah. think it has to be. So yeah. you're not doing science if it's not. Yeah. You can yeah. use the word. That doesn't mean you're doing it. Yeah. Yes. We, we did that do science thing. Use it as a verb. Yeah. Jonah loves that. <laughs> yeah. So um, to bring this forward, I kind of want to bring this. So we talked about how it, it it works, but how is it made? Like. The, I remember um, about the a year ago, MRNAs? The Sas- MRNA University vaccines? of Saskatoon has come out with a vaccine. I was like, whoa, that was quick. And it was a couple weeks into the pandemic. So the thing is, is once you know the sequence, it's actually really easy to make. Could you take us through that a bit? <sighs> it's actually complicated. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you have, essentially, you have the machinery that puts DNA together. And then you like drop one type of nucleotide at a time. So like... If you want an A, you put an A, but the A's are all like have a big thing. So you can't just put a billion A's. So it'll build one A and it's got a thing on it. Then you take it, put it, add something in it to take a thing out. So you're just like adding things in sequence. And I'm pretty sure they have automated machines that do this. Like it's the hardest part is actually like once, because basically what happened is they had this new virus. They made a sequence for like, they sequenced the, the virus, which again, doesn't take long. It's like, you can get that in like days. It's pretty fast. Their genomes are small, so it's fast. And then you take that and then you need to make it into something that your body recognizes as mRNA because it's a, so you have to like add your poly A tail and whatever, that doesn't matter, but you have to make it look like our mRNA. So like the whole process, you could probably find a whole new virus and then create what an mRNA would be like in like a couple weeks. Like it's fast. But the problem is that we don't know how safe that is and we have to do all our tests and we have to make sure that what we actually created is what we think we created. So we need to, we'll be like, we'll make a process and be like, oh, we made this. But then you have to make sure that what you made is actually that and it's pure and there isn't, you know, like other issues in it. So well, it's then, all- Well, even then you have to now make- a couple billion doses and that's part of the problem with like because all these there's things keep getting pushed back right because like making millions of copies of something is harder than making hundreds of copies of something so yeah, and remember, they keep yeah oh yeah, i remember hearing something about chicken eggs and gestation and stuff like that now yeah so they used how to do you that actually to make a vaccine you, they used to use, and I think they still they still do use it for the flu vaccines because the, the flu vaccines is like we've got a formula already and we just need to wait for to see predict what strains are going to be the most important flu flus running around that season. And you want to hit the ones that are going to be like more damaging, essentially. So your best guess on what the most important flu strains will be. And then you basically take those and you make it so that they can't infect people anymore. So um, basically one of the ways to do that, to inactivate a virus is to take a human virus and grow it until it can grow in chicken. So, but now you making it grow in chicken has made it to a point where now it can't really infect humans very well anymore. And like then in a that live you can, chicken? No, in like an, in an egg. Okay. Because this is how, like, a way that they kind of, like, a way to, like, inactivate a vaccine. You can also, like, blast it with UV. Or nowadays, you, like, basically engineer the specific part you want it against. But um, vaccines, like most drugs, you what people do first 
And what's effective kind of ends up being the standard. So now if you make something else, it needs to be cheaper and or better to be marketed and to be used. But now yours has less data. So now no one wants to use it because it's new. And known, unknown, unknown, unknown is definitely a thing in medicine. You're showing up first and best dressed. Yeah, like yeah, it almost mm -hmm. adds a layer to the thing that you're trying to figure out, right? Mm -hmm. Well, because like by changing it into a chicken virus, you've actually changed the virus, and you don't know which part you've changed. Like, yeah, well, that's why it takes time to make because you have to do it until it makes something that's still gonna work. Yeah, exactly, and that alone needs its own tests and its own trials and its own experiments. Just yeah, to and they'll calibrate take it to that the test. experimental phase. But like, it's there's way more complicated than what I'm explaining. And if you really mm. wanted to know, you'd have to get in this scientist because like I just have a very cursory understanding as somebody who's just going to be issuing the vaccines, just enough to answer questions. Um, though I will say this is this Where is do you new. Put it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I can describe the, the the CRISPR format. I've actually read some papers on that. Yeah, the CRISPR is pretty sweet. That's not yeah, used so to like can... make things yet, but the I ju just before we move on to that, I want to note that like even the flu shot, if you are like allergic to chickens and eggs, you can get the flu shot now. They have found that that's not really an issue, and there's always epipens around if it is, but it's not really an issue. So if you are super allergic to eggs and you've never gotten a flu shot, we have removed that, and we can give you flu shots now. Go is that ahead. just a recent development or it's like last couple of years oh cool last few years yeah because i i do remember hearing that like super don't give to anyone with chicken allergies when i was like doing my last degree i had a prof from the uh microbiology lab where they do flu shots in canada so um or where they like make the vaccine do research on it so and he was saying yeah. like yeah can't give it to people with, with chicken allergies but now recently it's like yeah you can do that Okay, so I don't yeah, know so when the, it changed. The newer methods of CRISPR they can do with batch batch encoding. So if you just have to find any other piece of DNA that has that sequence and then chop those ends off and then use that as a guide to set the CRISPR thing forward. Yeah. So rather than having to drop one droplet, you can automate them now. They just yeah. have machines that can do them in, but they have the process refined. Okay, I knew so that they would have developed time. something like. My, my genetics knowledge is like five years out of date now, so. Could, um, um, for the lay person, can we uh, give a definition of CRISPR for those who don't really know what the heck's going on? Oh yeah, I should look it up because I always forget one it's of the five a, letters in the acronym. It's a, I, I don't remember what it means, but it's a basically a bacterial enzyme that you, it, what it would do is it would recognize specific little DNA sequences that were of viruses and then it would take those sequences remember them and then if they ran into that virus again it chop it up so it's kind of like an immune system for a bacteria but it's specifically recognizing dna sequences whereas our immune system recognizes proteins and um yeah, and the proteins handy thing with sugars. Too is that you can feed it a string and it'll say it'll that string that you feed it will tell it where to start where to stop and what to put in the middle so all you have to do is engineer that string and that's what you feed it Okay. It just and allows then, you to amplify creation. So it's, it's it a, a technique to allow you to make DNA a, sequences okay, faster and better. Yeah. So it's a technique because yeah. it sounds like it's a, it's a type of machine or a process or something. Yeah. And it's something. It, it's, it is sort of a machine and a process because <laughs> the machine is developed for the process and the process is developed for the, mm -hmm. for the, um, schema i remember yeah. uh, but cl clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats i remember That's reading it. about it recently That's with it. regard to um uh making new types of wheat and rice. yeah they definitely it's definitely already being used in um and there's heard, a lot of i i good things to be honest um to like i had to do some like agriculture in my genetics degree and to be honest i found it obscenely boring and hated it you don't um, like plants though <laughs> i had a, I, yeah whatever I'm, I'm not interested in plants biologically just that's a personal thing so i kind of slept through that class so um, i know that they there's a lot of work going on in like modifying wheat and modifying like corn and rye and all the like things that we eat i just didn't care at the time so i don't really remember <laughs> most of it <laughs> So on the path of mis, uh, dispelling myths, maybe yeah. you can put two cents into the, I heard 
lately some people are, are worried about taking vaccines because of the development process included some fecal fetal tissue or something like that do you know stem cells. have you heard anything about that i don't know sounds like a rumor to be honest um it might be i don't know like I thought it was just trolls at first, but I looked into it and there's actually like part of the process. So as most things, it's a, uh, it's not completely untrue. It's just a, it might uh, just be a cell line. Well, they that... use it in the development confirmation and production processes. Like part of the experimentation, they use oh, so some fetal tissues. So I guess technically yeah. if you're against them using fetal tissues at all, any part of the process should make that out of bounds for you. Yes, yeah, so it's so what they use is fetal cell lines. So instead of like it's not actual like at one point it was harvested from like probably a um umbilical cord or something. And then they turned it into like an immortal cell line that you use for experiments because they're human cells and they're like undifferentiated human cells and you use them to like for experiments for safety and like to grow it and stuff how is that different from a stem cell then it is a stem cell oh it is a stem cell that's exactly what it is yeah they, they just say fetal cell lines to freak people out like it's a stem cell oh well that actually <laughs> legitimately confused me <laughs> no problem i thought it was something different because they used a different word yeah it's um sometimes again politics get into science a little bit you don't want to hurt yeah i'm seeing that more and more <laughs> mm -hmm. let me show a picture of a it's, cute it's baby well, the, i didn't notice it as much in my last degree but now i'm doing a degree with medical backgrounds it's all over the place so mm -hmm. so if i could ask you then uh um for the for the purposes of the vaccine like production process could you maybe explain a little bit about the refrigeration requirements and stuff to it because i think yes. that's okay. probably not communicated well in the public either it just it needs to be really cold is what they say um and the thing with is that like just so the, it doesn't fall apart though or it's what? the the mrna itself so a lot of biological tissue and bio like bio biology stuff and like mrna is just not stable so the only way to have it stable is to keep it at like minus 80 degrees Celsius or the Moderna's minus 20. But it's the, just, the thing is, is that it'll just fall apart once it's warm after a certain amount of time. And then once it it's like if you like take ice cream, think of it as ice cream. OK, you take ice cream out of the fridge for too long and it starts to melt. Even if you put it back in the fridge, it's like not right. Yeah. So and there's no way to like get it back once it's like that. But it's like ridiculously cold ice cream so you is it because just if oh but like if you're if you're if it's warm that means there's energy being added to it and that energy changes its state or essentially it it's just that like that? like a lot of biological molecules aren't super stable so when they are like when they're in a hot environment too long then they'll break down and your body like mrna doesn't last very long in your body anyway it gets it gets turned it gets like it gets red and then they make proteins out of it and then it falls apart it starts to fall apart and gets degraded anyway so like it's not it's a molecule that's made to be a temporary messenger so it's not like terribly stable in the first place and so, so just curious then with that in mind if if a truck stalled and all the vaccine in the truck went bad and then they took it to a fridge and started injecting people nobody would know the people there getting the, the, like the, the people getting the injections would be like, yay, I'm getting my vaccine, but it wouldn't work. Oh, that's there was crazy. An it, like the were, MRNA yeah. wouldn't get into the cells. And even if it did, it would be like partially degraded. It wouldn't work. So no, that's why you but I remember need to, that's the, they all have like such intense tracking processes to not break the cold chain. Uh, there was a incident in the States I, a couple weeks back where a uh, hospital was losing that was a um, couple months back and that was a pharmacist yay for the oh, profession yeah. um who was well, no no i'm thinking like where they had to like they were facing in a like there was a power outage or something so they're like everyone gets a vaccine oh yeah that right one. now and yep. well yeah and uh that one they just gave it out because well we might as well use them there's no reason to mm -hmm. waste them 
Because once you, like, you don't want to inject something into someone's arm that's, like, really, really cold because it'll hurt. <laughs> so, mm. but, like, it it does. But People need the, to deal with pain better, honestly. Well, whatever. This is Just unnecessary pain. But the, um, the, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Like they're stable for like a few hours. Like I think it's the Pfizer's only stable for like six hours or so after at room temperature. So once it stops being that cold and like, again, we're basing it off of like, we don't like, what if we have it at minus 72? Is that still acceptable? We don't know that because the experiment was at 80 or colder. That's what so I was going to So if it's at minus, too. like we don't have enough information to know if being at minus 72 is still enough like if you get drugs from the drugstore and they expire three months from now are they still good four months from now is there something that happens between like you know april 30 april 30th and may 1st that makes them not work no it's just that's what the best available data we have that we can guarantee its efficacy that's what it's about it's so if it's stored at 78 degrees Celsius for five hours and then goes back to 82, is it still okay? Well, the company would say, well, no, we can't guarantee that it's okay, but it's probably fine. Right? That's CYB there. It's cover your butt. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Thing. It is. Um, and it's just like we just don't have enough evidence to know. So we have to follow the exact same things that they did during the trial. Just, yeah, we don't just know. to be responsible and diligent. Yeah. So, and so the viral vectors are more stable and I think they're both stable at fridge temperature, to be honest, at like minus four or, or plus four, sorry. So, and that's what allows them to be delivered through community pharmacies is because community pharmacies don't have minus 80 freezers. They don't have minus 20 freezers because they, they'll have like regular fridges. They're not usually like the same fridges you buy from a store because they need to be like better for lack of a better term. Um, but yeah, like ventilation, air movement and humidity is I've seen those in restaurants and stuff, the walk-in fridges. Well, the so in, walk-in in a, freezers yeah. have different specs than their walk-in fridges do. Yeah, like well, the one that you'd see in a pharmacy is usually gonna be just like a more expensive fridge that's just better at regulating itself and keeps track of its temperature. Like that's it's but there's still you still need to have like a better level because like of because you, you need to guarantee that you don't want to lose stuff because again vaccines are expensive and especially like even like the covid vaccines like everyone's kind of getting them without a copay but like they're still expensive and we don't want to lose them how expensive are they really i don't know i actually as i was thinking that i was like man i wish i knew how expensive the covid shots were but um i don't actually know because it is kind of um, what you guys look um, for that, I'm guessing, is that we're kind of expecting to just get the shot. Okay, it's actually uh, not as expensive. It's like 30, 40 bucks a dose. Yeah, I was going to say, usually it's, they say it's all the R&D, but the public paid for all the R&D this time. I yeah, lost. but it's still yeah. like, it still costs money to produce and bring it over and all that. St keep the cold chain is probably where most of the money's going. Yeah, the cold chain itself probably costs more than the, the vaccine does to produce. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, if you were selling this, wonder... at, of, like, if you were selling, like, there, there's no like upcharges on it. Or if there is, well, there are upcharges to Pfizer, but like less. Yeah. Anyway. I wonder if we've advanced in refrigeration technology because of this and no one's just. No one cares except for like Refri frigid air or the something. refrigeration companies, companies are just like making a killing. I, I did see something <laughs> about how like like high quality refrigeration companies are just like our stock is gone. We've just been I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, you know what? That actually leads me to the point I wanted the the last point I wanted to make too. Anyway, so um, you, I got a number here it says like fifty percent of the five point three billion doses that were reserved like on orders by countries was 13% of the global population. So just getting back to like the distribution and the costs and things like that, how is it that we're okay with the fact that 13% of the world's population, the richest, whitest people on earth have orders for all of like the inventories of half of the entire production of these vaccines in 2021? Cause they're rich 
and they it's about countries buying power. So everyone wants to sell to the United States because the United States is the best market for buying drugs. That's why Canada gets less drugs because there's only 36 million people here. That are Japan or yeah, France like, or UK. And like, we have like, it's it's literally that, that statistic is just about money. But we produce and that's sad. drugs and we take. Like we're an exporting nation, I think, of drugs. But because of the states, we sell so much cheap medication, like generics and stuff to the states. There's, we have a few companies, yeah. But that... I, I don't get how even the order system, like how is that not racist? I don't get that. It's like, definitely. What world could we possibly fathom that that is an appropriate measure of distribution of a life-saving pandemic when other people's infectivity makes our infectious chances worse? The other thing is. None of is it that... makes sense to me um like the u.s has the highest rates of covid so of course we need to get it to the u.s first because they have the highest rates of covid so that's a justification but i think i honestly think it really comes down to who can buy the most vaccine at the highest price and that's sad and that i and but it's appalling it's not it doesn't good like that we could literally just part ration it out to every country and let the countries decide how to distribute it to their own people then everybody could plan for it. They'd know ahead of time what they're getting and when they're getting it. But this this like pre-order system where countries like Canada are getting two or five times more than they need on order just because they want to put orders in for every single company's vaccine. Well, you like, need that's some just kind demonstrably of... the worst possible approach to resolving a pandemic, you... right? Now, we do have mechanisms. Now, here's, here's the... Now, you'd need some kind of transnational entity to handle such a thing over um, the national ones that the world is doing right now. So, but the thing is, is that the transnational uh, or the international community on this has either been corrupt or silent on this. So you get someone like the UN who would have, was supposed to have some enough political clout to deal with this, but like we haven't, been, they haven't really been hearing anything. And the WHO has been, talking out both sides of their face for like since the beginning of this thing so um it's being left to those national governments and to uh you know very naked capitalist interest to, to jump in the un did there was that i'm pretty sure it was the un that had the program that like you're supposed to give your extra vaccines to other countries um correct me if i'm wrong on that yeah, it was like an, an agreement, but no, no, there's no accountability. There's no enforcement of it. Like, yeah. But they're not helping countries plan. They're going to blame countries for a stupid, corrupt, and inefficient rollout, but you won't tell them when they're going to get a plane load full of pallets of medication. Well, like, and the, so if you need a cold chain, then you have to be prepared. Yeah. For like, like, and it's the, the entire the, process. Yeah. Who's... And, was this is the best way to approach a human being crisis by denying some human beings based on borders and, and political affiliations. Like I hate to say this, but it's probably just that there's not enough oversight. It's not like people being malicious and being like, how can I make the most money? It's just a lack of oversight. But it can't be a scientist who came up with this plan. Oh, no, no scientist would have ever come up with this as an efficient idea uh, as a way to save the world, you know? <laughs> And they could have asked anybody at any university, any professor around the world would have said, this is the dumbest possible way to roll out a vaccine worldwide for a human being crisis. And nobody cares. Like that's, again, one of those things journalists are just dropping the ball on, in my opinion, because you're making things worse by by being unprepared, by being I feel like, what with your vaccine. I feel like yeah, I it's part of because I, I don't want to I don't I, I like I can't say it's racist because there's no one being overtly like haha screw Africa um but at the same time the result is that Africa is kind of getting screwed but that's um but at the same time we are experiencing something on such a large scale that we're almost stuck with doing what we can and witnessing the tragedy of it and and when it comes to when and i hate to say this and be that guy but if your neighborhood's starving which family are you going to feed first well you're going to feed your first and then you're going to feed your neighbors and then you're going to feed their neighbors in that order um and 
it's I, I feel like oh you say that you're so heartless it's like to some extent you have to be somewhat heartless um but at the same time we're like we don't know in, in america and canada we know very accurately um what the COVID outbreak looks like right so but in these developing countries we have no idea what's going on we have no idea like the only like in africa the only country that we really have a good sense of what's going on is in south africa and in asia you keep hearing st- like we don't we have no idea what's going on in like what's really going on in places like iran or north korea or some of the smaller balkanized states in the steppe there and russia's just a big question mark and china's just a big lie so what do we do india doesn't even have a census so you don't even know how many people are there never right. mind how many got tested so we could give them these things but at the same time you give them to someone like like india is not they, they have they have a lot of problems there but they're not even the worst you give it to some you know a uh, backward banana republic regime in the middle of Africa, how, what's to make sure that that government, which you don't even trust to maintain human rights of their citizens, if there even are citizens there, because, you know, you have monarchies and warlords set up, what's to say that they are going to distribute this in a responsible manner themselves in a in an appropriate manner? So what do you do? You go in with the UN, you know, blue helmets and say, you know, hold hold everyone at gunpoint and and forcibly vaccinate the people that, you know, we've determined to be the ones that need to be vaccinated, healthcare workers, those at greater risk. And so this like, I think you're taking it to the extreme though. It could really be as simple as giving it to universities because there's so much bureaucracy and so many people's eyes on universities. It would be really easy to get a million people to watch how the university dispersed it. So like there are super quick and easy solutions they could have tried and they just chose not to. Yeah. But if you give it to someone like Harvard, they're going to give it to only black people or something or only (laughs) LGBT people. And then, but the point is they have all the mechanisms and processes in place to double check people's work because they're already a bureaucracy, right? You don't have to give it to the government to give to people. You could give it to the fishermen's union. If a country is mostly a fisher fisherman community like Ghana or something, right? So like based on what your local economy is, you could give it to whatever, whatever, whatever organization that's already there already pays for all the infrastructure. You could give it to them. Well, the other thing is the way they're going to steal it is with everyone watching. We're still only about four months into the vaccination campaign and um, like the animal might change completely in another month or two. And by September, we could be dealing with completely different issues on this entire thing. We, uh, we, we don't know. So, But as a historian, what's your idea on on the way people are ignoring this as a problem? Do you know what I mean? Like, shouldn't we know better by now, having seen history? (laughs) I hate to say it like that. Um, But we haven't really seen anything like this before. In history before, we would have just been like, people are dying. Um, Let's go around and make them comfortable and then die with them. or uh, you just wait for the tragedy to end and see what's left. Um, and right now we're actually doing historically, if you want to compare it relatively like that, um, like we're as all the problems that we're having, it's, it's, it's amazing what we've still been able to do, even despite all the bickering nonsense and stupidity that we're dealing with. Um, like, cause you look back in history and in the, the 1330s when the black death hit uh in you know in relation to all the other stuff that was happening at that time uh, 100 years of war you get um the cooling of the earth over the course of a couple hundred years for climate reasons we don't really fully understand i'm sure someone does but um what they call the little ice age crop wrote you know so people's immune system anyway whatever what do they do kill all the cats <laughs> It's just like, it's just, we, we as humans do stupid things. And the fact that- You're saying it's amazing we did anything at all? It's kind of what I'm saying, yeah. And the stuff, the stupid shit that we are doing is um, pretty indicative of humanity as a thing. And the fact that we're actually talking about like what we can do, and I'm not saying it's like, you know, it's just business because there is, and I think- Actually, 
And one thing I've been thinking about in the last couple of days in relation to this and this very thing is that our society is being strained and tested right now. And the things that worked with our old system with like the 1776 system and the post uh, World War II institution uh, of our system, they're being strained and tested. Um, and people are experimenting and trying things. And I feel like right now we are in a, we're being forced and we're doing, and we're actually are experimenting with what can be done. I'm hearing actual theories of alternatives of governance of uh, scientific things. And people are actually thinking about this now because of it. It's not just like, um, you're still getting stupid, like YouTube clickbait videos, but like we're not the only ones making videos like this thinking about what do we need to do what does it mean to be talking about this we have a m chance here to uh think about becoming more than we are and i think to some extent we are taking it um and i sort of like i want to agree with you like the romantic inside of me that believes I'm not in humanity being romantic and, though and i think a lot of this is just if you look at what clickbait means, though, it means people gravitate to trash. Oh, yeah. And if we ask ourselves why we're in all these, the shitstorm that we're in, even despite the progress we have made, we're, we are still, as you said, we made incompetent steps the entire way. That's all related, in my, I think, directly to our, our public stupidity and gravitation towards clickbait. Like, yeah. that's the cause. That's the reason COVID is even an issue. They, they could have nipped it in the butt. But it for all this, taken, like we wouldn't have, it would have still taken a couple of months, but it wouldn't have been as big a problem. But that's that's also but, hindsight. No, but hindsight's nipping it great. in the butt means it's done in six months. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we now out of lockdown and completely sterilized for the last year. Had we done it properly or more competently? Yeah, that does. The thing is, me too, is that like, <laughs> well, we we don't always listen to scientists for a reason, too. Like, scientists don't all like I like even people that are epidemiologists, which I knew from even before the pandemic, were like saying things like people need to wear masks all the time to prevent flu, and I'm, it just they don't always aren't like they know what the best science says but they might not always be the most aware of what's going to work and what sort of economic things are going to happen like i think epidemiology has gotten a lot better and i think after this pandemic it's going to get even better because people are going to be analyzing again 20 years down the road we'll know like what economic forces were really more at play because we will be able to see it better with a couple of feet with a lot of insight but like we can't blindly listen to scientists either because they're also people that are specialized. Like the whole point is that we need to listen. We need to look at what everyone's saying and see what different groups that people that think differently and have different expertise together. So, well, and, I think and we need to look at what everyone's saying together and then make a best a decision based on what everyone's saying. As a historian, I think that a lot of people want change now and they're like, and they want like they want solutions. I want them now. We need to know what the right thing is, and we just need to get the people that know that. It's like no one knows what the right thing is. It's part of being human. Go uh, read some um, uh, Alan Watts, and like. Um, but you, what we need to know is like realize is that change happens slow, and it happens gradually, and if we're responsible about it and we take the harder path, I guess, then we can make better change. But at the same time, um, like we do actually have to be making a change. We can't just, one of the things that we, like I've been complaining about, I guess forever is like you get a cynical attitude and also this parental uh, attitude towards it. It's like, Oh, it doesn't even matter. And, you, and it's just that coupled with a, um, everyone's out for themselves, you know, that cynicism, but coupled that with a, what's, what are they going to do about it? What are they like, uh, we need to wait for, like, we're talking about scientists, but like we are in living in the same world with them. We're all here and we can't expect other people to just go out there and solve all our problems. Um, because then you end up in a state that, um, 
is more important than the individual when you know we everyone's looking towards the prime minister or the president what are they doing about the covid it's like what are you doing about covid <laughs> well i think all we should have to do is follow guidelines we should be able to trust them for that right i think that's sort of what we were getting at with that whole episode on trust too is there when you have an established professional like scientists reporting to other established professionals like elected representatives alone those two together should be able to tell me how to achieve our national goal. And I should be able to follow that knowing that that probably makes sense if that's the best they could come up with. But it's not like, un unpatriotic how do we deviate too. so far from that. And like, it's not unpatriotic to ask, are you sure? Can I see your sources? Like, because, you know, trust isn't blind, especially when it's something this is like, Here's what we think. Here's the evidence. But when you when the Canadian government comes out with a, a study that says this and they only talk to 38 people, it's just like my trust is wavering. <laughs> well, this is hard too because uh, people expect like hard answers, and there are no hard answers in COVID. Like nothing. So politicians and like not just politicians, but like everyone's looking for this like how what's the best way to treat COVID? What's the best way to like, what's the best economic changes we can make to prevent the spread? And there was, like, at least a year ago, there was no answer. No one had any idea how to do a lockdown. We were just, like, doing stuff and seeing if it worked. I remember there was a book that came out in 2017, of all things, uh, called Deadliest Enemy by Michael Osterholm. It was really, I read it, like, a year ago when this all started, and I was like, okay, this is very... Um, uh prescient and he pretty much details exactly what's happening here um i think he's writing another one on um i came up with another one on uh no this was 2020 he that came i don't know it's march it's 2017 i'm looking at it and essentially he he goes through what a response would look like in his uh in his last chapter of the book and it's even his like he was pretty doom and gloom and i think we did better than he predicted in the book but we were very messy in a few places and his guidelines from looking for at the um uh like a, a guy like that and his guidelines from looking at the hiv epidemic and other like sars and h1n1 um like he has like 40 years of experience in dealing with this stuff and like no one was that's talking. sort of my point we've known for 40 years that this was a very real possibility and but it doesn't feel we had, real that's the well, problem in 2002 we had sars and we've had scientists telling us ever since that we need to be prepared for a pandemic so not knowing how to do a lockdown is still part of the same problem i'm criticizing the fact that we didn't know how to do a lockdown is proof that we didn't even try we didn't even think about it beforehand and we had every opportunity to listen to the scientists who told us to listen like that problem still hasn't been fixed so whether it's COVID or a flood or a fukushima disaster we really need to figure this out well and we need to not have our politics be so swayed by what people are thinking that day because no one was thinking about a pandemic for years and years and years even when like sars and h1n1 were happening most people were just like yeah sucks to be them and then would just continue to go on with their regular life and just like, like not flu. yeah like just not go to the regions where there were people that had that and then some bipartisanship would be nice you know trudeau and o'toole coming together and being like wear masks and everyone's like damn it we can't we can't i can't just not wear a mask because i don't like trudeau and i can't not just wear a mask because i don't like the conservative party and then both sides have to now put aside that and, you know, be like, okay, fine. To be fair, it, we the public like, enable it. It's our clicking. Oh, absolutely. That's what we do. We do. Accurate. Well, that's we the point is that like no one was thinking about a pandemic. Critical. So the government wasn't focused on a pandemic. The government was like, yeah. well, you know, what's going to get me elected is this bill about housing prices in Toronto. Like that's that right so there, that is the problem. Well, and the like no one's talking about, and that's just a, that's just a drawback of our four year system is that what they do in the four years is what they think is going to get them elected. And it's based mm -hmm. on what they think people want rather than what's necessarily the most helpful, like dealing with. What I'm with... getting at is that flaw, that little tweaky flaw, that mm -hmm. little thing in our system is an existential threat itself. That thing is just as important as COVID fixing that problem and getting our government to be more responsive, 
for any natural na uh, natural disaster whether it's biological or otherwise and the thing is we were like canada's pretty prepared to deal with like flooding in certain parts of the country that flood all the time and <laughs> and there's like there's like avalanches in certain areas that that are dealt with, have dealt with yearly and there's you know like there's definitely like disasters that are like prepared for but like a pandemic no one's thinking about pandemic and there's always going to be black swans too it's that like too stuff that you just can't prepare for yeah the like, procedure for going about a collected international uh aggressive like that's really important we should know how to handle a tidal wave that covers the earth in case it ever happens not to know that one specific situation but to know how we would organize ourselves and make decisions well we're going to handle Trust a lot of straws really and everyone's going to just drink from the tidal wave until it's gone perfect <laughs> that's it we solved it <laughs> like, and i don't mean by propaganda and like controlling the news media either we need to find a free and consciously architect a design a system that will work in this type of situation because we know for a fact the way we did it doesn't work mm -hmm. like, well, that think, to me is just as much a threat as the actual I think threat part of because it is it's the, a systemic problem I think, underlying the threat i think part of it is the cult of um the cult of the individual in politics and the popularity contest i can't remember who i was watching a couple of days ago when they were saying well we don't need to vote for people we need to vote for um like policies. policies and you you but by voting for the policy you're essentially with your vote you're not voting for the party you vote for a contract with the political leader and they will have to you know you're voting for someone to carry out a contract and so they can't make lies and if they don't do the contract over four years well guess what you don't get plato lies. talked a lot about that though yeah the people are too dumb for that system to work i think we are getting smarter though and Plato was thinking but politically. Well, I mean, I don't mean like generally dumb. I mean, politically savvy means you're sitting there reading the law. Yeah. <laughs> Most people don't do that. But, and like, you're going to get bad uh, things, but essentially you stop getting like, you can't, it cuts out a demagogue like AOC or Donald Trump or something like that, who would just play the popularity game to get elected. And, but like the other thing with Plato is that he relied on a lot, very heavily on the philosopher king. And, and then he's like, well, how do you make one of those? It's like, well, you know, you just, um, hey, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, that's a, that's an old problem though. And I, I, and I think. Well, that's what the academy was for. It was to make that. Yeah. Virtue. But I think in a free society, we can foster anyway, we're getting into, we're getting away from the COVID thing and uh, we could talk about this for hours. And um, I think I want to, I think I'm going to bring it back into the conclusion because uh, uh, we're, uh, we're threatening to uh, getting all curmudgeon about the government. Uh, <laughs> um, so any last thoughts from megan on uh coronavirus maybe even what can we do from here uh a year and a month after it all started or so yeah so it was crazy and nuts that this happened at all and um i think what people can do is keep trying to keep yourself safe keep your family safe but also another thing that got, has gotten overlooked a whole lot is managing your own chronic conditions. Like we read out those lists of things that are that are issues like cardiovascular disease, lung disease, kidney disease, smoking, obesity. If like any of those those things like kind of apply or might apply in the future, manage that because the more healthy you can be as a person, the better chance you have of dealing with not just coronavirus but other things. And the other thing too is like your own mental health too because that's also important if you're in a bad spot and you get sick that's also not that you're not going to do as well either so managing yourself is probably one of the most important things you can do right now physically mentally everything so get outside if you can go do whatever you can to, to help yourself and protect yourself and your family do what you can be responsible that's what i got 
I guess uh, I'll I'll be the lighter light bear. <laughs> <laughs> Use this time to do something that you would have otherwise not been able to do. Learn a language, read more, exercise more, whatever. Just set some goals. Um, it sucks that you're forced into the position of solitary confinement. But while you're there, you might as well come out of something with something that's greater. Something you wouldn't have done otherwise. I made um, a shelf yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing so many people just on the Twitter sphere and, and Facebook verse or whatever. So anecdotally, I'll, I'll admit, but so many people just bored out of their minds and all of them have bucket lists. <laughs> They're telling me that they couldn't go on vacation this year. They couldn't do this this year. They had to drop out of school this year, but they still got a bucket list of things they could have learned or done or seen while they were on COVID. They just chose not to make good use of the time. So. Um, be honest with yourself. If you're going to whine about COVID, make sure that you're making the time worthwhile. Otherwise, you're just whining. Yeah, they don't make COVID just another excuse. Yeah, it's not an excuse to do nothing. It's an excuse to do something. <laughs> that's uh, that's actually really well put. So uh, I think that rounds it up. Um, I think this was actually a really good evaluation uh, of, of it. And I think it turned out uh, better than yeah, thanks for coming, Megan. Yeah, thank yeah. you for having Always me. Appreciate Anytime. The I, I do want to have you on again to talk about um, the role of pharmacy in our society because there's a lot of stuff surrounding that. That's I can, talk about. I can do that for sure. Yeah. But um, so uh, we'll um, remember to like and subscribe, share with your friends and family, and uh, just you know live a good life and see you guys around. Live life, life comments. Yeah, live a life with some gravitas. Frivolously? <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Bye, guys.